Welcome to Horror Babble. Today we've got a special treat in store for you. If you're a Horror Babble patron, then you'll already be aware that today's recording has been in production for the last month or so. Several listeners suggested the possibility of Horror Babble writing an original Karnaki the Ghost Finder story, and after giving it some careful consideration, I put pen to paper, and today we're thrilled to present The Haunting at Ravenglass. Naturally, I've done my very best to deliver the spirit of Karnaki, whilst trying to present the story in a contemporary manner, in this case, by doing away with the standard narrative in favour of an entirely dialogue-driven approach. In summary, Karnaki has been hired to investigate an apparent case of haunting at Montague Castle, on the outskirts of Ravenglass, Cumbria, in which a lone, ghostly figure has been observed wandering the corridors of the castle's guest wing after dark. But, as is often the case with Karnaki's investigations, things aren't quite what they appear to be. The haunting at Ravenglass is dedicated to our Cthulhu and Yellow Level patrons, each of whom is named in the video description below. This production wouldn't have been possible without your support. We hope you enjoy this one. The Haunting at Ravenglass A Karnaki the Ghostfinder Story by Ian Gordon Based on characters created by William Hope Hodgson With thanks to our producers, Krista, Ashley Lindsay, C.S. Pace, Robert Daniel Picard, Elia Reese, and Wes Sale. By Jove, Karnacki, you, you've barely touched your steak. After listening to my yarn this evening, Dodgson, perhaps you'll understand why. It happens I may never look at red meat the same way again. Certainly, you're out of sorts, Karnacki. Yes, Taylor, and with good reason. Well? Patience, Jessup. I'll get to the thing momentarily. Dodgson, pass my pipe, will you? Now then, I've just returned from a trip north, Cambria, as I'm sure you're all aware. In total, I spent four nights up there in response to a letter from Miss Elizabeth Montague, the daughter of Mr. William Montague, the current proprietor of Montague Castle, near Ravenglass. Dodgson, I believe you're familiar with the spot? Indeed. Uh, I was there in 96. Of course. Now, listen. Dodson aside, the rest of you chaps may be unaware that the Montagues have been offering lodgings to the weary traveller this past twenty years or so. A guinea affords you a good-sized double room in the castle's east wing, an evening meal, and a hearty breakfast. <laughs> hearty being the operative word, if truth be told. But the fact of the matter is that Montague Castle, in all its splendour, has a terrible reputation for being something of a Haunted house. I imagine you've heard talk of Tom Fool, Dodson? Aye, Thomas Skelton, no less. Rarely seen, but often felt. Mischievous spirit, they say. Exactly right. However, it wasn't with regards to old Tom Fool that the young Miss Montague contacted me. It was on the subject of something much more peculiar, possibly outranking that strange case of the whistling. This peculiarity, on which I'll elaborate if you'll hold your horses, Jessop, aroused my interest, and so I made the journey to Ravenglass by train. Departing the locomotive, I stepped out into the terrible chill of the north, and presently was much relieved to be met by the Montague's gentleman-in-waiting, Mr. Reese. Into the warmth of a fine jaunting car I was invited, and within a quarter of an hour we were on the outskirts of the castle. But it was already late in the afternoon, and, as you may know, the weather in the lakes can be rather volatile especially in early spring. Dark clouds surrounded the castle, preventing me from getting a good look at it, a kind of foreshadowing, if you will, for what was to follow. Brees hadn't a word for me the entire journey, which in the end I concluded was fortunate, given the awful mood that had taken hold of me in the presence of that foreboding castle in the valley. Miss Montague met us by the door to the east wing, ushering me inside prior to the imminent downpour those terrible clouds were threatening to unleash. Reese simply vanished. I presumed he'd gone to tend to the horses. In the moments that followed, I learned that I was to be the third of three guests that first night. My counterparts, a travelling salesman from Preston, and a young painter from Egremont. The former was Hodgson, the latter Powell, 
Gina Powell, if memory serves, a talented artist, but I digress. In my eagerness to get to work, as it were, I insisted that Miss Montague lay it all out for me, and without much ado, off we went through a chilly hall and corridor, up an elegant spiral staircase, and across a vast landing, at the end of which was an open dining room, complete with mahogany dining table, scores of bookshelves, a dozen family portraits, and several ornate tapestries, of little or no consequence to my tale. The butler, Pace was his name, seated me at the dining table, and saw that a platter comprising cured meats and cheeses was under my nose before Miss Montague could begin her recitation. Over a glass of port, she related, as best she could, the crux of the matter. In essence, the strangeness amounted to this. Over the preceding three weeks, a number of guests housed in the East Wing had reported sightings of an ostensibly supernatural nature. In each of the reports, of which there had been seven, the guest, or guests in question, had described the sudden appearance, or visitation, of a ghostly figure at the southern end of the long corridor connecting the bedrooms on the first floor. This figure, according to the reports, would be seen to traverse the length of the corridor in a northerly direction, stopping before each of the bedrooms along the way. Upon reaching the third door in succession, it would extend a hand, and in the act of operating the door handle, it would vanish abruptly. I asked Miss Montague if any of the reports had offered a description of this nocturnal visitor. But, regrettably, the guests had been vague in this respect, proffering little more than that the figure had been male, of medium height, and wore a curious look of consternation on its face. Deep in thought, I resolved to consume a selection of meats from the platter before me, excused myself from the table, and followed Mr. Pace to my room at the northern end of the adjoining corridor, the very corridor in which the figure had been repeatedly sighted, and, yes, you guessed it, chaps, to the very door before which the figure had frequently disappeared. Dodson, do you recall the room in which you were a guest all those years ago? Hmm, can't say I do, Karnacki. No matter. As you know, chaps, I tend to travel light, and so, thanking Mr. Pace for showing me to my quarters, I entered the room with my travel case and opened it up on the bed, a nice four-poster, too. Perhaps you remember the bed you slept in, Dodson. Can't say I do. Fine, fine. There's no reaching you, Dodson. Listen, in cases such as this, I tend to arm myself with a healthy scepticism, it does little good to walk into a place with a mind wide open. Much better to keep oneself grounded. Do you follow me? Time and time again I've investigated reports of ghouls and spectres, only to discover that the figure at the end of the hall is merely a flickering flame, the grasping hands little more than the dancing shadows of twigs in the moonlight. Remember the farewell Henrietta case? But, that said, on occasion... The world of the supernatural makes demands of us, and we, as investigators, must remain sensitive to the subtle changes in light, sound, and energy vibrations that are indicative of such demands. I doubt any of you chaps will ever forget the County Bravadas case. I hear those disembodied voices to this day. Nevertheless, as I was saying, my travel case was open on the bed, and I began the obligatory process of sifting through its contents namely, a box of chalk for the purpose of marking out protective circles, five empty jars, should the need to create a water circle arise, my dusty and trusty copy of the Sigs and MS, a length of rope, which, as it turns out, was entirely unnecessary in the end, and various miscellaneous items pertaining to the task at hand, a task in which the full extent of its particulars were yet to be revealed to me. I was about to consult the Sigs and with regards to bothersome apparitions, when there came a knock upon my bedroom door. The chap standing there when I answered the summons was none other than my neighbour, Hodson, the travelling salesman from Preston. Hello, he said, as he shook my hand. Here about the ghost, are we? Yes, I returned, though the term ghost may be a little premature at this stage. Nothing premature about it, continued Hodson. You'll see for yourself when the clock strikes nine. Exchanging civilities, and unfortunately committing to further idle banter during our evening meal courtesy of the Montagues, I waved Hodgson off and quietly resumed my studies. Dinner was a pleasant affair, in which Miss Montague served as hostess in her father's absence. Mr. Montague was apparently away on business in Edinburgh. Hodgson ate well, but 
It was his appetite for port that made his presence at the table notable. <laughs> what a mouth that northerner had on him. Powell, my other neighbour, kept to herself, though I have to say she did appear to be mildly interested when I spoke of my plan for the evening. I'll cut right to it here, chaps. My plan wasn't much of a plan at all. As a matter of fact, I merely intended to observe. If there truly was an apparition, a spirit, or whatever you want to call it, roaming the corridors of the castle, I wanted to simply catch sight of it in the first instance. Only a fool, without knowing what he or she is up against, would embark upon anything more ambitious than that. And, as I've already said, it's essential to be a little sceptical at the outset. And so I finished my meal, which concluded with a remarkable apple strudel, I might add, excused myself from the dining table, and returned to my bedroom to prepare for my vigil. I'd informed Miss Montague, as well as Powell and the now intoxicated Hodgson, to confine themselves to their rooms from 8.45 p.m. I felt it mightily important to set the stage, as it were, to give the uninvited guest free reign. At precisely 8.55 p.m., I emerged from my bedroom and proceeded to position myself in the quiet and shadowy northwest corner of the corridor, a mere stone's throw from my bedroom door. There was a discernible chill in the air, aided by a steady but gentle draught which tormented the naked candle flames about me, casting strange shapes which danced across the walls. I felt the conditions were apposite for the nocturnal visitor to make its first appearance. And appear it did. How best to describe it to you? Well, I suppose I'd have to say that I felt the thing before I saw it. With that damnable chill assaulting my senses, I was already unnerved. Perhaps that very dip in body temperature was what attuned me to the thing. But when I first sensed that presence, uh, it was akin to the sudden onset of goose flesh one ascribes to feet passing over their grave. And then I saw it, or him. For a human outline it was assuredly though translucent in nature, like so much mist or steam organized into the shape of a human being. Do I make it clear to you? From my vantage point, there in the shadowy recesses of the corridor, it was as though I was invisible to the thing, and I felt with some certainty that it was simply impervious to my presence. And, assured by my supposition, I observed as the figure went about its routine, the very routine described by Miss Montague. The mist-like figure that walked in the manner of a man crept along the corridor, first stopping to look upon Hodgson's door, and then continuing in the direction of Powell's door, before once again stopping in its luminous tracks to gaze upon it. I have to admit, chaps, the chill of the corridor did little to prevent the sweat from breaking out of my brow as the shape moved towards the third door, my door, nearing me in the process. And I tell you, it was as silent as the stars. The vagueness of the descriptions the previous guests had given of the thing were now quite understandable, and I was able to corroborate several details. It appeared to be male, it was of medium height, and yes, I suppose, for what appeared to be little more than a mass of luminous vapour, one could be forgiven for saying that it had a look of consternation on its face. <laughs> I tell you, chaps, it was quite something. And yet, despite its proximity, I was still convinced the thing wasn't aware of me. It had a single purpose, to gain entrance to my bedroom. I watched closely as its hand passed through the solid door handle. I continued to watch as that extraordinary appendage clutched thin air, and I stood aghast as the thing promptly vanished before my eyes. And when I say vanish, I mean vanish, a swift and sudden departure. Immediately I made for the door and thrust it open, but there was nothing to behold within, simply my bedroom, as I had left it a mere ten minutes earlier. I was baffled. But in that moment it occurred to me that perhaps the figure's destination wasn't quite as important as its origin, and so I armed myself with a piece of chalk and stepped back into the corridor. Slowly, ever so slowly, I retraced the path of the visitor, from its final position in front of my bedroom door to the point in which I first observed it, in the southeast corner of the passageway. And there I happened upon another door, somewhat smaller than its neighbours, and as I learned upon attempting to open it, a locked door. I felt rather strongly that something of significance lay on the other side of that door, 
and thus I resolved to discuss the matter with Miss Montague in the morning. I spent the remainder of that first evening in quiet contemplation by the fireplace in my bedroom. The logs had reduced to smouldering embers by the time I elected to rest, and though my protracted meditations yielded nothing of value, I knew the key to the thing lay on the other side of that locked door. Dodson, pass my tobacco, will you? The following morning, having slept rather restlessly, I hauled my weary frame to breakfast a little after seven a.m. Miss Montague and Powell were chatting amongst themselves, and I was surprised to see Mr. Reese at the far end of the table, a plate stacked high with bacon, sausages, eggs, and the like under his nose. Noticing my entrance, he eyeballed me curiously, nodded absently, and returned to the task of eating without much ado. By the time Hodgson surfaced, the rest of us had finished eating, and I raised the issue of the locked door with Miss Montague. There was no mystery, she said. It was simply another bedroom, a bedroom yet to be renovated for guests, and a single room at that. I asked if she'd unlock it for me, to which she assented, though I have to say there was a subtle reluctance about her manner that struck me oddly. Following one last cup of tea, the two of us excused ourselves from the dining table, a gesture that Hodgson, in his stupor, failed to notice, and proceeded in the direction of the locked door. Given the amount of effort required for Miss Montague to unlock that door, the large brass lock refusing to yield to her numerous wiggles and jiggles, I concluded that it must have been locked for a considerable amount of time. Four years, in fact, was what she told me. Apparently, the room had once belonged to a young boy by the name of David, she said, a cousin who had lived at the castle for a time, following the death of his father. The boy had complained about the room, she added, saying it was always too warm, too stuffy, that he would wake up wet and sweating night after night. Now, chaps, take note, Arkwright, this will resonate with you. Professor Garder, in his work Experiments with a Medium, talks in some detail about compressed atmospheric conditions, and the effect of such upon individuals confined to small spaces. And, specifically, he emphasizes the most common cause of such conditions. Do you follow me, Arkwright? Incorporeal visitations, of course. Precisely. Incorporeal visitations. The sudden and inexplicable appearance of apparitions, spirits, spectres, ghouls. Call them what you will. And so, in hearing about this boy, this cousin of the Montagues, I felt fairly certain that the figure's point of origin was in fact our present location. The boy's room, or the unrenovated bedroom, as Miss Montague had referred to it. But the boy's story didn't end there. Miss Montague went on to confess that the primary reason for the room's current state of desertion was the boy's sudden disappearance. Yes, chaps, the plot thickens. Allegedly, the boy had grown increasingly displeased with his lodgings, often waking in the middle of the night, dripping with sweat, complaining of foul odours, and I must stress this next point, for it is pivotal to understanding the thing, of seeing strange reflections in the large mirror affixed to the south wall. The boy had been unable to describe the reflections, other than noting, on more than one occasion, that the surface of the glass often appeared to be damp with condensation, particularly on the nights he had suffered from the sweats. Oddly, though, he noted that the window on the east wall was always perfectly clear of condensation on these occasions. Though it was unquestionably his own face, he would say, reflected in the mirror, he would also say, and I quote, that the boy on the other side of the glass wasn't quite himself, that the boy saw with eyes of his own, and that he listened with ears of his own. But when he brushed the condensation away, he would conclude, the idea that the boy wasn't himself was brushed away with it. Odd chaps, I know, but there's more. Intrigued by Miss Montague's story of the missing boy, I tentatively approached the mirror on the wall. It was some eight feet in height from floor to ceiling, and some four feet across, quite a size altogether. It lacked a distinctive frame to speak of, and in terms of its position on the wall, it looked as though it had been positioned there to hide something. Another door, perhaps. I inquired as to what lay on the other side of the south wall beyond the room, to which Miss Montague informed me, much to my disappointment, that there was nothing there at all, simply the southern outer wall of the east wing. Regardless, my instincts told me that I was on the right track, and so, dismissing Miss Montague, 
I once again turned my gaze upon the vast looking-glass. I studied the mirror minutely, tracing its numerous scuffs and scrapes, looking for subtle etchings that might resemble letters, or even words. And though my search yielded nothing by way of a hidden message, it did in fact reveal something much stranger, a series of interconnecting marks that formed a curious shape, a familiar shape. Retrieving several sheets of tracing paper from my travel case, I returned to the mirror, and began, in a terribly rough and by no means accurate fashion, to trace the marks. I continued to trace until I had copied the entirety of the shape onto six sheets of paper, and then, rather crudely, laid them out on the floor beneath me. And there it was, the outline of a human being, the shape of a boy little more than four feet in height, the rough suggestion of arms held aloft in protest. Now, I know this may be difficult to follow, chaps, and almost impossible to believe, but nevertheless it was my firm belief that the vanished Montague cousin had physically penetrated the surface of the mirror somehow, becoming lost on the other side. Do you see? It all comes down to compressed atmospheric conditions. Just as spirits can enter our plane of existence under such conditions, that young boy, highly sensitive to said conditions, entered theirs. I returned to the dining-room, asked that Pace fix me a piping hot cup of coffee, and asked Miss Montague to invite each and every individual on the castle grounds to attend an audience with me, on the double. Within ten minutes, Pace, who hadn't forgotten my coffee, by the way, Reese, Hodgson, Powell, and Miss Montague were sitting opposite me at the dining-table. I tell you, chaps, the suspense was palpable. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' I began, "'we have here a most unusual case of haunting.' and by that I mean the ghost in this case is not a ghost at all, but a living, breathing human being. But Karnaki, a man made of mist, you can't be serious. Patience, Jessop, allow me to get to the crux of the thing, and pass the decanter while you're at it. Now then, where was I? Ah, yes. I know, I continued, addressing the group at the table, that this may be difficult to believe, but the figure some of us have seen is little more than a visitor from the other side, a visitor from the mirror universe. The mirror what? Hodgson all but yelled. The mirror universe, I repeated. And Hodgson fell silent. The rest of the group remained equally so. I eyeballed Miss Montague. It is true, I said, that your cousin disappeared four years ago, but if you'll permit me to conduct a certain ritual this evening, I'm sure the six of us, together, can bring the boy back. Miss Montague was speechless, but the look upon her salient features was one of quiet relief, and dare I say it, hope. In order to successfully effect his safe return, I added, the six of you will need to assist me with the ritual. And I rambled for a while, briefly touching upon the Samar ritual, and what would be required of each of them. But I felt it pertinent to leave certain details out for the nonce, so as to ensure at least some degree of level-headedness. And so I spent the rest of the morning and the early afternoon in the unrenovated bedroom, preparing for the ritual. Firstly, with a broom of hyssop, I swept away four years' worth of dust, cobwebs, and general detritus, and measured out a semicircle ten feet in diameter, with a large mirror at its midpoint. This would form the perimeter of my chosen method of protection, the water semicircle. The drawing of the chalk line would have to wait, for there were further intermediary stages to be discussed with my colleagues, namely the nature of their roles as spectators outside of the semicircle, and the guidelines pertaining to their general conduct when in position. Furthermore, though I'd studied the segment on interdimensional gateways in the Sigson manuscript, and was moderately well versed in the seven primary principles, this was to be my first experience with such phenomena, in a practical sense and so it was absolutely essential that my planning be meticulous in every detail. Thus the hours passed, the six of us traipsing back and forth along the shadowy corridor between the bedroom and the dining-room, Pace providing a steady stream of provisions rich in minerals at my request. Sodium depletion can be a real nuisance in certain situations. <laughs> right, Taylor? The hour drew near, and at approximately 8.30 p.m., I informed the others that the time had come to draw the semicircle in chalk. I did so immediately, and, of course, was careful to never cross the line. 
I proceeded to complete the water semicircle as I've described many times before, by smudging garlic beyond the chalked line, and by going over the semicircle a second time with that certain water to make the second sign of the Samar ritual. You chaps know the routine by now. My counterparts were situated on the outside of the semicircle, each standing two feet apart from one another. Their collective presence, I said, positioned thusly, was to compensate for the inevitable shift in atmospheric conditions the imminent ritual would invariably produce. They watched my actions incomprehensibly, despite my numerous attempts to clearly and unambiguously illustrate my intentions. Safe within my protective barrier, I turned to face the mirror, and my gaze was immediately drawn to the faint outline of the boy, his arms aloft in protest. I shuddered, but felt reassured by the water semicircle and my compensatory company. And then, reciting the spectacle of Toth, I raised my arms and held them aloft momentarily, mimicking the shape of the boy. The ritual initiated, there was little else to do but wait. The minutes ticked by, and the six of us stood in absolute silence, holding our positions. Hodgson coughed once or twice. The poor chap was still ill at ease following the previous night's debauch. It was precisely 8.57 p.m., when the thing I'd anticipated began to manifest itself. Just as the Montague cousin had once described, I felt myself breaking out into a sweat, whilst in front of me, on the surface of the mirror, small globules of water, condensation, began to appear before my eyes. I quickly turned to face my counterparts, who, unlike myself, appeared to be unaffected by the sudden change in atmospheric conditions. Their collective presence was proving to be very effective indeed. The water semicircle, too, was having the desired effect. The phenomenon was contained within it. As the layer of condensation intensified, I could just about make out the shape of a figure beyond it. Not myself, mind you, but the figure I'd witnessed in the corridor the previous night, that mist-like individual, male of medium height, that look of consternation on his face. Or, perhaps, the thought briefly occurred, it was me, for I was male of medium height, and presently I sure as the days long had an unhealthy look of consternation upon my face. But when I would have moved, it was the figure in the mirror that moved. Closer and closer it encroached, until I was forced to react in kind, and slowly, hesitantly, in an almost unconscious effort to ensure that the thing moving towards me was in fact my own image, I glided towards the glass. Beads of sweat peppered my brow. I had to resist the urge to brush them away, for to do so would have hampered my line of sight. I continued to amble forward in the direction of the mirror, slowly, ever so slowly, until my nose was practically touching the glass. But, presently, the condensation was so thick that I was unable to perceive anything beyond it. My face, his face, nothing at all. Yet halt I did not. I continued forward, ever forward, towards the condensation. And, to my commingled sense of exhilaration and horror, I stepped through the surface of the glass. <gasps> To describe it now, well, I'm at a loss for words, chaps. Imagine being submerged in a body of water for several seconds, only to emerge thereafter entirely bone dry. I wonder if this poor example means anything to you. When I emerged on the other side of that strange portal, my suspicions were confirmed, for I discovered another world beyond that watery veil. And there, in a room precisely the reflection of the unconverted bedroom, I gazed upon the reflections of my counterparts, each of them situated exactly where I'd instructed them to stand, but in reverse. Do you follow me, chaps? I was in the mirror universe, and I gazed upon living reflections. But somebody was missing. The other Thomas Karnacki. Damn it, Jessop! I was just getting to that. Ah, uh, anyway, my reflection had indeed crossed over. And what's more, the figure witnessed and subsequently reported by all those guests, myself included, was the very same Thomas Karnacki of the Mirror Universe. You see, chaps, in that moment of realization, I began to understand. The other me had appeared to the guests of the East Wing in an effort to summon me, knowing that the only individual capable of recovering the missing boy was the Thomas Karnacki of the boy's native universe. 
I knew I had little time to take action, and so I took another step forward in that strange reality, frantically seeking the Montague cousin. He was difficult to locate initially, the reason for which will become clear to you momentarily. Between and beyond the reflections of my counterparts, I searched long and hard, but lo and behold, I eventually began to perceive the crude profile of a small figure in the shape of a boy. Like the Mist Man, or the other me in our universe, the Montague cousin in the Mirror Universe appeared indeterminate, little more than a murky mass, a caricature of humanity, a moving sketch. I beckoned the boy, and immediately the shape came running towards me. I gripped what I believed to be the boy's arm, turned, and leapt through the cloudy portal. We landed in a heap on the other side, the boy and me, and from the look of shock and exasperation I caught on the face of Miss Montague, <laughs> I understood the boy hadn't aged a day. What had happened to him on the other side would be a story for another time, perhaps. For as he lay there within the safety of the semicircle, I sensed confusion and, understandably, fear. But as I lay there, all but ready to congratulate myself, Hodgson did a terrible thing. To this day, I don't know what it was he thought he saw in that old mirror, but he abandoned both his reason and his post, and rushed headlong, destroying the water semicircle as he went, straight towards the glass. Instantaneously, I crawled on my hands and knees towards the break in the chalked circle, in a desperate effort to restore it. But it was too late. You see, when Hodgson penetrated the semicircle, he triggered a cascade event. The mirror, or doorway, that we'd established had, up until that moment, been held open forcibly by a combination of the unified presence of the five figures beyond the semicircle, and of the invocation of the spectacle of Toth within it. But now, with the water semicircle destroyed, the portal was closing rapidly. Hodgson's last conscious action in this world was to propel his body through the air in the direction of the closing doorway. But he didn't quite make it. Well, some of his torso did. And that, Dodgson, is why my taste for red meat isn't quite what it used to be. And that's it? That's the top and bottom of it, Dodgson, yes. Questions? Well, what happened next? We cleared away all evidence of the ritual, saw that the boy was fed and watered, and reported Hodgson's accident to the police. And although no evidence of foul play was uncovered, it was quite unsurprising that the man's death was considered more than a little odd, that his legs, trousers and all, were found in the unconverted bedroom, and his torso, well, what remained of it, was found on the cold, hard ground at the bottom of the east wing's south wall. In order to allay their concerns of a reprisal, I stayed on in the company of Miss Montague and a justifiably shell-shocked Powell for the following couple of nights, insisting that we'd put an end to the haunting at Ravenglass. Leave the rest to Tom Fool, I say. Oh, I'm confused. What exactly was it that allowed the other Karnaki and the boy to travel between universes in the first place? Well, Taylor, it, it was a combination of things. The boy and his sensitiveness to incorporeal visitations was a contributing factor. And don't forget, other spirits walked those corridors. Any one of them could have triggered those unusual conditions I mentioned. The boy merely exploited the phenomenon, albeit unintentionally. And your reflected counterparts in the mirror universe, could they see you when you cross the threshold? And if so, why couldn't the other Karnaki see you in the corridor? It all boils down to one's sensitiveness, Arkwright. Some see, others don't. And who can say for sure what it is one has and hasn't seen? As for the other Karnaki, perhaps he was aware of me, and his appearances, as I've stated, were intended to lure me into his universe. And there's the question of time, too, isn't there? You say the boy hadn't aged a day, yet when you encountered him in the mirror universe, he wasn't frozen in time, as it were, was he? No, Jessop, but you're correct when you say there's a question of time. The boy may not have aged physically, but I'm absolutely certain that that troubled youngster will carry the burden of his experience mentally for the rest of his days. As I said, his story is for another time, perhaps. One more question. 
If the other Karnacki had truly been attempting to reach you all this time, then why do you think it took him so long to successfully do so? A difficult question, Dodson. Perhaps the most difficult of all. We spoke of time, and of its effect on the boy in the mirror universe. How is it that he was unable to simply step back through the portal? And, conversely, how is it that he was able to make contact with the other Thomas Karnacki, to persuade the other me to help him find a way home? Perhaps he didn't make contact with him at all. Perhaps there was no other me. Perhaps the figure I saw in the corridor was simply a reflection of my will, a will born out of my insatiable need to understand the misunderstood, that unyielding desire to seek out and liberate the haunted and the desperate, and, later, a will encouraged by my realization that the Montague cousin, thanks to his tremendous sensitivity to certain conditions, had unwittingly stumbled into another world, a world I'm still at a loss to explain. As for what those other guests and witnesses saw, again, I name Tom Fool as a likely candidate. Do I make it clear to you? On this occasion, no, Karnacki, you do not. Marvellous. Out you go. 